Now, we have uh, two speakers for this session, and I, I will introduce the first. And we're particularly fortunate to have with us today Dr. Um, Klaus, who is uh, president of the Czech Republic. He's a, an economist, economist, formerly prime minister and minister of finance, and he's got a special interest in climate change issues. So I think uh, we would like uh, you to speak, Dr. Klaus, and uh, welcome him in the usual way. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, for the invitation. Thank you for giving me the floor. It's a great pleasure and honor for me. And really, thank you for inviting an innocent politician to participate <laughs> in, your, in your really sophisticated and, and serious, serious debate. Uh, well, at first, I would like to start with saying that uh, not respecting the title of the conference, I will continue using the term global warming rather than its substitute, retreat already signaling, but in any case misleading term, climate change. And second, I, I planned not to concentrate my talk on the current or potentially forthcoming uh, climate uh, global warming itself, because given the available data and uh, given the conflicting um, scientific arguments, I don't see it as a problem, as a phenomenon which is threatening us. I probably made a mistake because I was sitting uh, during the last session before the break at the balcony and I didn't have the feeling that I have a right to, to enter, enter the discussion from, from above. But I was really shocked and horrified by the so-called summary of the discussion. Horrified, shocked, really. I, I really came here with all my presidential duties expecting that there will be a serious exchange of views, that there will really be a dialogue, not just monologues. But to listen to the summary, it was an a priori prepared statement in the morning in the hotel during the breakfast and not, not a statement summary, which, is, which was the result of sitting seriously for several hours here and, and listening to the arguments on both sides. And it's a very depressing feeling, I must say. I will talk, not as I said, not about the global warming itself. I will talk about the global warming doctrine. Because this doctrine, not the global warming itself, is the issue of the day and the real danger we face. This set of beliefs is an ideology, if not a religion, which lives more or less independently on the science of climatology. Uh, climate, climate and temperature are used, or perhaps very often misused, in an ideological conflict about human society. It is frustrating that the politicians, the media, and the public misled by the very aggressive propaganda by the exponents of this doctrine and all their fellow travelers do not see this. I hope that today's conference could be a help in, in this respect. Some of you know it, I have expressed my views about this issue in a number of speeches and articles presented or published in the last couple of years over, all over the world. And my book, Blue Planet in Green Shackles, has been translated already into 17, 17 languages and published in 17 countries. I spoke about it also several times here in, in Great Britain last, last time um, in the global warming Policy Foundation in October last year. 
I, I, I must say that the global warming doctrine has not yet presented its authoritative text. It has not yet found it, it's Karl Marx who would write its manifesto. Uh, this is partly because no one wants to be explicitly connected with it and partly because it's uh, not easy to, to formulate. Uh, the global warming doctrine, this new incarnation of environmentalism, is not a monolithic concept that could be easily structured and summarized. And I, I have the feeling that, uh, that uh, I, I confirmed this feeling of mine even much more uh, during this morning in this, this afternoon. It's not a monolithic concept. It is a flexible, rather inconsistent, loosely connected cascade of arguments, which is why it has been so successfully escaping the scrutiny of science. It comfortably dwells in the easy and self-protecting world of the so-called interdisciplinarity, which I at least I translate it into Czech as the absence of discipline. Uh, a similar approach was used by the exponents of one of the forerunners of, of this doctrine, of the limits to growth doctrine. And uh, as we see, some of its protagonists were the same. They just changed topics. What follows? is my attempt to summarize my reading of this doctrine. First, it starts with the claim that there is an undisputed and undisputable, empirically confirmed, statistically significant, global, not regional or local warming. This is the point number one. There are many question marks about it. Second, it continues with the argument that the time series of global temperature exhibits a growing, non-linear, perhaps exponential trend, which dominates over its cyclical and random components. Again, for me as a former statistician and econometrician, a big problem. Third, this development is considered dangerous for the people in the eyes of soft environmentalists or for the planet among deep environmentalists. Number four, the temperature growth is interpreted as a man-made phenomenon which is caused by the growing emissions of um, carbon dioxide. These are considered the consequence of industrial activity and of the use of fossil fuels. The sensitivity, sensitivity of global temperature to even small variations in CO2 concentration is supposed to be high and growing. <coughs> Point number five. The exponents of the global warming doctrine promise us, however, that there is a hope the ongoing temperature increase can be reversed by the reduction of CO2 emissions. And finally, point number six, they also know how to do it. They want to organize the CO2 emissions reduction by means of directives or commands issued by the institutions of global governance. They forget to tell us that this is not possible without undermining democracy, independence of individual countries, human freedom, economic prosperity, and the chance to eliminate poverty in the world. They pretend that the CO2 emissions reduction will bring benefits which will exceed its costs. This simple scheme can be undoubtedly improved, extended, 
supplement it or perhaps correct it in many ways by the distinguished participants of this conference. But I do believe that its basic structure is correct. The missing global warming doctrine manifest, manifesto should be built along these, these lines. There are many disagreements about this doctrine among the scientists in natural sciences, as was demonstrated here this morning and this afternoon. But I also know, but I also know the stances of social scientists, especially economists, who do not buy into this doctrine either. These two camps, and the same was here today, these two camps usually do not seriously talk to each other. They only come into contact with the self-proclaimed interdisciplinarists from the other field. The social scientists are usually taken aback by the author authoritative statements that the science is settled. And the scientists in natural sciences a priori assume that there is nothing hard and serious in social sciences. I think Dr. Mitchell speaking here before the break made this point explicitly. The politicians, after having lost all other ideologies, welcomed the arrival of this new one. They hope that the global warming card is an, is an easy game to play, at least in the short or medium run. The problem is that they do not take into cons consideration any long-term consequences of measures proposed by the global warming doctrine. Let me therefore outline, briefly outline, what the field of economics has to say to that. It is, of course, only a preliminary scheme, not a statement pretending that science is settled. First, the economists believe in the rationality and efficiency of spontaneous decisions of free individuals rather than in the wisdom of governments and their scientific advisors. They do not deny the occurrence of market failures, but their science and their reading of history enables them to argue that government failures are much bigger and much more dangerous. They consider the global warming doctrine a case of a grandiose government failure which, which undermines markets, human freedom and prosperity. Second, the economists, at least since Frederick Bastiat, consider it their duty to warn policymakers against the unintended consequences of their actions and against not differentiating between what is seen and what is not seen. Third, the economists know something about scarcity and about the importance of prices and warn against any attempts to play with them. They believe in the cost-benefit analysis and in the rational risk aversion, not in the precautionary principle. And they have also a rather developed sub-discipline called energy economics, which should not be disregarded and forgotten suddenly. Number four, the economists are aware of externalities because they themselves formulated this concept. They understand uh, it's, by the way, when I was this morning at King's College, I 
I, they showed they showed me the the paintings of uh, Professor Pigou, who was teaching here, and he was one of the four runners of that concept. Um, the economists understand its enormous complexity and consider it dangerous in unqualified hands. After decades of studies, they do not a prioristically see the world as full of negative externalities. Number five, the economists base their thinking about intertemporal events on a rather sophisticated concept of discounting, which I will touch later. And uh, finally, the economists have uh, some experience with the analysis of time series. Statistics and econometrics used in economic analysis is full of sophisticated models, not used in natural sciences, because these are based mostly on the analysis of cross-section data samples. Um, they know something about problems with the imperfect quality of data, about measurement errors, about data mining, about precariousness of all kinds of averages and other statistical characteristics. They also have some experience with computer modeling in complex systems with pseudo correlations with the sensitivity of parameter adjustment etc etc so i i fully disagree with with professor mitchell that the economists are innocent in their in their models and mathematics and statistics it's, it may be just the opposite for me the models used in in climatology and in this debate are usually the models not made by scientists but by computer experts, by systems engineers, and so I consider them much inferior as compared to the econometric, econometric and economic modeling. So I, for that reason, I think that um, the economists uh, have the right to comment on the statistical analysis of climatologists and all on all the time series we were looking at the whole whole day. After this brief um, outline of the economic way of thinking, let me make three hopefully explanatory comments. First, the economists do not believe in the precautionary principle and do not see the outcome of the cost-benefit comparisons of CO2 emission reductions as favorably as the adherents of the global warming doctrine. They know that energy demand and supply patterns change only slowly and see the very high degree of stability in the relationship between man-made carbon dioxide emissions, economic activity, and the emissions intensity. They don't expect a radical shift in this relationship. The emissions intensity as a macro phenomenon moves only very slowly and doesn't make miracles. They are therefore convinced that the very robust relationship between CO2 emissions and the rate of economic growth is here and is here to stay. If someone wants to reduce CO2 emissions, he must either expect a revolution in economic efficiency or must start organizing a worldwide economic decline. Revolutions in economic efficiency, at least in relevant and meaningful time horizons, were never realized in the past and will not happen in the future either. It was the recent financial and economic crisis, not a technological miracle, nor preachings by Mr. Pachauri, what brought about a slight reduction of CO2 emissions. The 
adherents of the global warming doctrine should explain to the people worldwide that they consider the economic decline inevitable and desirable. Second, the relationships studied in natural sciences are not influenced by any rational or irrational behavior by subjective valuations of the variables in question, nor by the fact that people make choices. In social or behavior sciences, it is more difficult. To make a rational choice means to pay attention to intertemporal relations and to look at the opportunity costs. It is evident that by assuming a very low close to zero discount rate, the proponents of the global warming doctrine neglect the issue of time and of alternative opportunities. Using a low discount rate in global warming models means harming the current generations vis-a-vis -vis the future generations and undermining of current economic development means harming the future generations as well. Economists representing very different schools of thoughts, from William Nordhaus from Yale to Ken Murphy from Chicago, tell us convincingly that the discount rate indispensable for any intertemporal calculations should be around the market rate, around 5%, and that it should be close to the real rate of return on capital because only such a rate is the opportunity costs of climate mitigation. We should never accept claims they, that by using low discount rate, we protect the interests of future generations, and that the opportunity costs are irrelevant because in the case of global warming, the problem of choice doesn't exist. This is a quotation. Uh, this uneconomic, or better to say anti-economic way of thinking must not be accepted. And the final point, as someone who personally experienced central planning and attempts to organize the whole society from above. And I spent most of my life in communism. And when there was a discussion this morning about the regime shift, we experienced a regime shift, you know. I am I'm not sure about 1997 was the real regime shift. 1989 was the real <laughs> regime shift. So as someone who personally experienced such a society, I feel obliged to warn against the arguments and ambitions which are very similar to those we had to live with decades ago. The arrogance with which the Alarm, alarmist of the global warming doctrine and their fellow travelers in politics and media want to suppress the market, control the society, dictate the prices directly or indirectly by means of various interventions, including taxes, is something I know well from the past. All the old already almost forgotten economic arguments against communism should be repeated now. It is our duty to do so. To conclude, I would like to say that I agree with many serious climatologists or people from natural sciences who say that the warming we experience is or is on the horizon will be very small. Convincing arguments can be found in the Jan Plymer's recent, recent book. I, I, is he here now or not? 
I, I'm afraid that he didn't sell the arguments from the book this afternoon. <laughs> the book is much stronger. <laughs> uh, I agree with many other climatologists who, who say that it's difficult to prove that the human effect on the climate can be measured because this effect is lost in the variability of natural climate changes. And from the economic point of view, in case there will be no irrational interventions against it, the economic losses connected with such a modest warming will be very small. A loss generated as a result of a completely useless fight against global warming would be far greater. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your attention. I have great pleasure in introducing Nigel Lawson, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, and whom I had the occasional disagreement in the past as I was opposition treasury spokesman in the UK Parliament at the time. I would like to commend his book, A Cool Look at Global Warming, because that indeed is what it is, and a good point to have this in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Una. Uh, the, the main title of the book, uh, in case anybody uh, has a few minutes to spare and might think of reading it, is An Appeal to Reason. And that is what I've been concerned about uh, on this issue. Uh, I, before I say anything, I think we should thank uh, Alan Howard for having staged and got together this event. One of the things that's concerned me about the issue of global warming since I first got interested in it uh, as a result of a conversation with uh, David Henderson, who's here somewhere, some years ago now, uh, is that there is so little real debate. There is a stifling orthodoxy, a political correctness, which is not right whether it's in science, it's not right whether it's in economics, it's not right whether it's in politics. And that was why, having uh, written the book, I uh, founded, uh, in 2009, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, uh, focusing very much on policy, because I totally agree with the speaker over there a moment ago, saying that, you know, science is one thing, public policy is another. Focusing very much on the policy, and uh, we're, and, you know, I'm fortunate to have Benny Pizer, who has conducted the foundation so brilliantly ever since its formation. Because I felt that there needed to be real, serious debate on this issue, and that is what the foundation is about. I think, as I say, that not only has uh, Alan Howard performed an enormous public service in getting, for the first time, maybe as uh, President Klaus said, uh, there wasn't quite enough uh, touring and throwing, quite enough debate among the scientists, but there was a fair amount. And that is, that is healthy, that is good, and it has indicated, it has shown that there is in, in the science, and this is all I would say about science, uh, but there is, and this is nothing disgraceful, no discredit to the scientists, but there is a great deal of uncertainty in the science. There's also certainty, I accept entirely, that uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions and concentrations in the atmosphere have grown greatly. I accept entirely, of course, I don't think anybody, uh, well, one or two, but I, that this is likely to have had a warming effect because uh, other things being equal. In fact, it would have a, a warming effect, other things being equal. We can't be sure whether other things are equal, but certainly on its own, it would uh, have a, a, a warming effect effect because it is a greenhouse gas. Whether greenhouse gas is the right term or not is the term that's always used. But there is huge uncertainties. Uncertainties, as has, appeared, has emerged during the discussion we've had between the scientists uh, today, uncertainties about the climate sensitivity of carbon. Major uncertainty. Uncertainty about the effects of clouds. 
the science of clouds, uh, uh, which overlaps with the climate sensitivity of carbon, but they are separate issues all the same. Uncertainty, uh, to follow from uh, Professor Svensmark, uncertainty about the effects of cosmic rays. So there are a lot of uncertainties. But I don't want to, and I think it's healthy that that has been brought out, because it is the, there has been an attempt to suppress these uncertainties, which I regret. Whether it is, as uh, uh, Professor Myrna said, because of the, uh, this, uh, having this monopoly of the IPCC as the only voice which is accepted by politicians, not by scientists. I think scientists are better at that. They realize that there are other views. But politicians have been uh, led to believe that that is the only view, the IPCC. IPCC views on the IPCC report, it's the only view that they need to take any notice of. But as I don't wish today to talk, and I agree incidentally, I don't need to talk for so long because uh, what President Klaus said uh, on the economics uh, and indeed on the politics is something which I wholeheartedly agree with and endorse. And there's no point in repeating that. Am I? But my background is in the field of public policy. I have, one way and another, been involved in the public field of public policy, I suppose, ever since uh, when I left the Navy 55 years ago uh, and joined the Financial Times, uh, concerned about writing about public policy. And indeed, I was the first energy correspondent in the late 50s that the Financial Times ever had. So I've been interested in public policy, and particularly public policy, in an analogous and similar area for a very long time. And then, of course, later, as some of you may know, I became actually a practitioner. I wasn't merely uh, an observer. And so I've been interested in this field for a very long time. And I have to say that it concerns me greatly that the policies on which the world, in theory anyway, even if not in practice, is embarked, and the, in which this country in particular is committed to, is something I feel is hugely mistaken, hugely wrong, and hugely damaging. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, there is another uncertainty which again impacts on what your policy choice is. And that is the profound uncertainty. Let us suppose that uh, the, over the years ahead, and I have to confess between these four walls to total ignorance, I do not know what the temperature of planet is going to be in 100 years' time. I know that there are many people here much cleverer than I am who know exactly what the temperature of the planet is going to be in 100 years' time, but I have to confess my disability that I don't know. Uh, but the, but the, the, there is another uncertainty, a huge area of uncertainty. Supposing the uh, temperature of the planet does rise in the way that the IPCC uh, says it thinks it will, what will be the consequences? What will be the consequences for the people and for the economies of the world? And in particular, obviously, I care about for the people and the, econ and the economy of this country, but for the world generally. And that is far from clear, far from clear. It's far from clear, incidentally, what the sign is, whether it be beneficial or harmful, because there is no doubt, and even the Inter-Academy uh, report uh, on the IPCCs pointed out how they cherry-picked, how they biased, how they had emphasized the adverse consequences of warming and had played down the beneficial consequences. So we don't know really how bad it is. What we do know... What we do know, it's quite clear, is that if you think of decarbonisation, which is the policy, if you think of decarbonisation as an insurance policy, then what you are doing is taking out an insurance policy which costs far more than the risks against which you're insuring, which doesn't seem to me to be a very sensible thing to do. Uh, it is very interesting if you look at what the IPCC actually has to say. On, not in the summary for policymakers, which is not written by scientists or anybody except sort of uh, apparatchiks uh, who are trying to put forward a particular propaganda line. If you actually read the reports of the IBCC, you see, for example, on the health field, 
The only health consequence of this is of the warming that they predict, which I suspect may be exaggerated, but I wouldn't know. Uh, the, the health consequences, the only one they consider to be virtually certain, is fewer deaths from cold-related illnesses. That is the only one, and that's there in the report. You don't hear that, but that is. Uh, if you're thinking of food, uh, food, they say that the, the global food production will be enhanced, certainly up to three degrees uh, Celsius higher than the temperature today. And again, as I say, they all uh, err on the side of gloom and negativism because they're trying to make a particular point. They're far from neutral, far from objective. And again, on sea level rise, which as uh, Professor Myrna said, uh, uh, sea level rise is the only thing which we are told there is unequivocally bad. Uh, let's say food production, it might, be, it might go up, and it will go up, particularly with the development of genetically modified foodstuffs and uh, gen uh, genetic engineering. Uh, we know you say, there are huge health benefits from a, a warmer world, but sea level does seem unequivocally bad. But even if you don't accept Professor Myrna's powerful argument that there has been no sea level rise. And certainly in the, the places he mentioned, it is recorded that there's been no sea level rise. So that's absolutely true. But there may be other parts of, that there has been a sea level rise and there may be a further sea level rise. But that sea level rise is minuscule. It's of no significance. It is, it is totally unimportant. And it is, no, <laughs> it is no threat to the people of this planet. But... Uh, it is uh, what is proposed is a real threat. The policies that are proposed are a real threat. Uh, fortunately, because the cost is massive, fortunately it is not going to happen. Uh, there is not going to be this binding global decarbonisation agreement. And a very good thing too. I mean, we know it's not going to happen. Uh, a huge... Uh, attempt was made at Copenhagen, uh, the, uh, at the United Nations uh, Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen. And here you had, at uh, Copenhagen, uh, the most favourable uh, consequences, the most favourable setup that you are likely to have, because you had in Copenhagen a new American president, President Obama, had come in committed to the uh, a new policy different from George W. Bush's of decarbonisation with, at that time, a d large democratic majority, a large majority of his own party in the lower house and a large uh, majority of his own party in the Senate. And even then it couldn't be done. Uh, it couldn't be done. So they tried again at Cancun, exactly the same result a year later. It's not going to be done. Sir David King, who some of you may know, former chief economic advisor, the, the person, uh, chief uh, scientific advisor, thank you, the person who sold this uh, whole crazy policy to uh, uh, Tony Blair, uh, he said, Cancun is the last chance saloon. Well, where is he now? Where are we now? Uh, indeed, about uh, uh, Sir David King, let me say one other thing. I agree that if politicians and economists should not pronounce on the science. But it is a grave mistake uh, for scientists to be left with the task of formulating policy, as indeed the gentleman over there agreed. And they did far too much of that. Scientists say, and scientists say, you, you know, carbon dioxide is a problem, therefore you must de decarbonize your, your economy and you must get a global agreement. That is nonsense and, it is, and uh, uh, economists and politicians have to take uh, responsibility for formulating the policies that had to be formulated, as indeed I tried to do in my own way when I was uh, Secretary of State for Energy uh, 30 years ago. I listened very carefully to the best scientific advice I could get, but at the end of the day, the responsibility for formulating policy was mine, and I accepted that responsibility. Why did Cancun and, and uh, Copenhagen fail? Uh, they failed largely because uh, neither China nor India 
the two countries who are making the, uh, like make the biggest, China already is, and India will, the biggest contribution to the increase in carbon dioxide emissions, which is expected in the next 50, 100 years, they were not prepared to play ball. And they were not prepared to play ball. They were quite right, quite right. The priority for these countries, and indeed for many other countries, but let's focus on these two. The priority for these countries is the fastest possible rate of economic development. They have hundreds of millions of their people in the direst poverty. In India, something like 40% of homes still have no electricity. They want to develop as fast as they possibly can to get to these people out of poverty and out of the consequences of poverty in terms of malnutrition, uh, preventable disease, uh, and premature death. And that means, among other things, not solely, it means pursuing the right economic policies, of course, but it also means taking advantage of the cheapest form of energy, and that is now, and will be for the foreseeable future, carbon based energy. So they're not going to give it up. Whatever they may say, they're not going to, and they're quite right. Indeed, for anybody in the West to tell them they must go from relatively cheap energy to more expensive energy and therefore increase the amount of uh, poverty, disease, malnutrition and preventable death, I think is most profoundly immoral. I think this is a moral issue and the present policy is a profoundly immoral one. The, but fortunately, they are not going to adopt it. So where does that leave us in this country and in the other countries in the West? But I care particularly, obviously, about this country. Well, of course, uh, the government of the day, the politicians, realize that it's going to be it's increasingly difficult to sell decarbonization on global warming grounds. So they're trying now to sell it on other grounds. They say, well, there's, you know, we're going to run out of, of carbon uh, fuels, so we've got to cut back. I remember, as I say, when I became Energy Secretary in 1981, the first thing I did was to got, get the bosses of the, of the two major British-based oil companies uh, to my office, and I said, tell me, tell me what I ought to know. And they said, well, I'll tell you, Secretary of State, that there is only 40 years of oil, extractable oil, left in the world. That was 30 years ago. What do they say now? They say there's only 40 years. They always say there's only 40 years. <laughs> they say, uh, in fact, so far from running out of carbon resources, we have never been so flush uh, because technology has improved the possibility of commercial extraction of oil, and in particular of gas, with the development of shale gas and the new technology of uh, uh, horizontal drilling and fracturing, the, the ability now to produce shale gas competitively and cheaply uh, it has transformed the energy position. There has never been such an abundance of carbon energy as there is now. So that doesn't run. Then they talk about energy security. Well, we've got energy security. We can't rely on Mr. Putin and this unstable Middle East. Well, again, the shale gas is all over the world. In nice places like uh, North America, South America, Poland, you name it. So we've never had less of a worry about energy security. Never. So there's no reason on that front. And then there's a further, the final lamentable reason they give. Oh, well, nevertheless, this will be a wonderful, um, wonderful way of creating new jobs, green jobs, if we go switch over to renewables. This is economic illiteracy of the worst order. Uh, um, the... The president mentioned Frederick Bastiat. One of the, Frederick Bastiat in the late 19th century, uh, one of the few really good French economists, uh, there, haven't been, <laughs> there haven't been many since then, uh, the, he uh, said, look, you might as well say you should go around breaking windows in order to create jobs for glaciers. Uh, and of course, as Adam Smith pointed out, uh, creation of employment uh, is not the object of economic effort. Indeed, insofar as employment has anything to do with it, the object of economic effort is to increase productivity, which means reducing jobs, so that the people can be employed, meeting other needs, which will, is what will happen, that um, 
that the people require. So it is, it, it is a new form of Luddism, really. But that's exactly what the Luddites did. They went around uh, smashing machinery to preserve jobs. And the green jobs argument is really, in, in economic and intellectual terms, no different from that. So that's where we are. The global agreement is not going to happen. We shouldn't waste our time. What do we do? We will do what mankind has always done and always will do. We will adapt to whatever the circumstances are, whatever the temperatures are, whatever the, the happens in rainfall, whatever happens in other ways, we will adapt. And we have never been better able to adapt. We have never had greater technological ability to adapt than we have today. And we've not adapted too badly in the past. The only problem is this country. This country has passed the Climate Change Act which, unlike any other country in the world, makes it legally binding on us to decarbonize pretty well completely the UK economy uh, by uh, 2050. Uh, it is absolute madness, because obviously if we do it, with, we're responsible for 2% of global emissions, if we do it when China and India are not doing it, and America's not going to do it either. Take my word for it, but you know that America's not going to do it either. So now the three biggest countries uh, in the world are not going to do it, and uh, so our 2% is neither here nor there, so there's absolutely no point at all. But not only, uh, not only is there uh, no point in it, it would be very damaging. Well, what does the British government say? And the same previous government said they. The British government said, we are, this is a lead we are giving to the world. We are the only country in the world which has this legally binding commitment. Yes, indeed we are, because no other country is so stupid. <laughs> uh, and this is something which the British government should be ashamed of. Uh, that is, we're the only country in the world that has this ridiculous uh, and damaging agreement. So I, I would like to do my conclusion to help the government, uh, which is what I always have wanted to do. And I think that they should not abandon it. They should stick with it as their policy, but they should say it should go into suspense until such time as there is a global agreement. Because there ain't going to be no global agreement. Thank you. <laughs>